and try to remember where this idea of neck deep in the big muddy came from. How many people in the audience know? I was kind of warned that there wouldn't be that many uh, because it came from 1968. And I think we are at a similar moment. And there's some news today that could, I mean, I hope I'm not being wishful thinking, but there is some good news today that maybe finally we have turned course and are wading back out of this uh, neck deep in the big muddy back to higher moral ground. So uh, this, this song, for those who don't know, was sung by Pete Seeger in 1968, critical midpoint of the uh, Vietnam War, uh, and he was censored on the Smothers Brothers. So a song, we don't, that's pretty unusual to be uh, censored, and if you listen to the song, you might even wonder today why you would be censored. But it's about, this, about a, a, a military maneuver where they're trying to wade across the river. They, get, they start off knee deep, and of course they can't turn back. The big fool says to push on, that's their captain. And then they're waist deep, and at the end, uh, the, the captain is neck deep, and he goes under and he drowns. And then the rest of the men say, turn around, we're going back. Well, that was considered such a metaphor with the, uh, Viet the Vietnam War at the time that they censored it. So how does uh, use of intelligence and abuse of intelligence fit in with that? Well, again, it, really in about the same time, there's just a few months difference here, uh, one of the CIA analysts that was actually a colleague of Ray McGovern's, his name was Sam Adams, um, had been to Vietnam, had been analyzing the enemy troop strength for months and months a year, and his figures came out that the enemy troop strength was much higher than General Westmoreland and the other generals were willing to tell the public and the media. And the reason for one of these abuses of intelligence or uh, fixing the intelligence at that time was because they didn't want to have the public go sour on the war. You know, what they ended up calling Vietnam Syndrome. So when you learn these truths about the war, now at the same time, in 19, same, same year, 1968, uh, Walter Cronkite, who was reporting on the war, you know, he got intelligent about it. And he actually then, uh, he had 60% of the American public watching Walter Cronkite, and he went out and said the war is unwinnable. And so there's been an effort ever since to kind of keep, uh, to defeat Vietnam Syndrome, which is that when people learn the truths about intelligence and whatever, they, they might be, come against unwinnable wars, wars that are uh, creating terrible, disastrous impacts and are, and are blowing back even on the American public. So I'm going to talk a little bit about 9-11 uh, and explain that the solution to uh, peace and to reducing terrorism had nothing to do with launching wars on Afghanistan and Iraq and uh, then of course the series of, of actually war crimes violating the law, committing torture uh, and, and then uh, kidnapping black sites turning on massive, massive data gathering on all of us, innocent people, non-relevant information on our, our emails and, uh, and uh, uh, communications that we now have learned through Ed Edward Snowden. That was done right after 9-11. The, 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 uh, in fact, it, initially it was done in even a more intrusive way beyond metadata. It was actually content. And they did it based on war powers. They have secret legal memos that were written, a whole series of them by John Yoo and others, beginning two, three weeks after 9-11. And these memos said that the First Amendment no longer is that important because we're in war. The exigencies of war have to take a, a first spot. And in essence, there's an old, uh, there's an old quote by, by Cicero, in times of war, the law falls silent. And that means that your, your principles that have stood the test of time, your constitution, your First Amendment rights of freedom of press and association and speech, um, your Fourth Amendment right uh, not to be, uh, be violated by an unreasonable search or se seizure, your right not to be coerced into a confession, which is what was violated by torture, all of those rights in law, and as well, those are our domestic, uh, you know, 
constitutional rights, but in addition to that, the treaty law. And the treaty law is, you know, one of the main things is the Geneva Convention. So beginning in January of uh, 2002, just a few months after 9-11, there is a memo also drafted by John Yu and Robert Delahunty. And this one said that uh, we need to worry about military necessity. And if, you know, if it's a military necessity, we won't be following the Geneva Conventions. Now, if, if, and of course, this is the, the, that went out to the troops. And of course, people think they now have the green light. If you're operating at Abu Ghraib or at Guantanamo or the CIA, uh, you, you believe, well, now it's been legalized. Everything that I thought was the rule of law has now been legalized. And, and eventually we get even to the drone uh, assassination, which is illegal, um, but it's, there are memos now that have tried to justify this legally uh, through you know, different ways. Okay, so those, in my opinion, are all really terrible non-fixes to the problems that existed before 9-11. The problem largely before 9-11, and this is not Colleen Raleigh, uh, this is not just me now, I'm really just uh, repeating what the, what the various official inquiries found. Now it took them a couple of years and sometimes even longer to, to come out with these and by that time people had lost interest and they were already in the, in the Iraq war and so they had already gone on to these, these uh, fixes for the problem which weren't so they, they really weren't paying very much attention but the, the real problems were the failure to share information okay wasn't that there was too, there, there was too much secrecy in other words okay and, and it wasn't just secrecy uh, inside of agencies where information was blocked. In the case in Minnesota, the information was blocked actually inside uh, the internal in the FBI. That's, that's one example. There were also cases where the CIA had been tracking a couple of the terrorist uh, suspects for a couple of years. They had been tracking them all over the world. They had actually a very short list at the time. I think there were only about 16 names on the CIA's terrorist watch list at the time of 9-11. Two of them were really, the, the, and maybe even more, were the actual hijackers. Okay, not now, we have a million because of this gathering of non-relevant info, but back then it was, it was quite accurate. But that information was not shared with the FBI until very late in the game, like a week before. And now to this day, they've never really determined why that was, was not shared. Um, this is this is an article. Now it took till 2011. Okay, we had 10 years later. Uh, one investigative reporter found out that there were was a memo that if that had been known by the people in the FBI. Now this memo was sent to seven or eight of our assistant directors, and you know one of them would have changed if he known what was in that memo. He said, "I want to, you know, nothing would have uh, been blocked on Musawi if I'd known this was the case." But he claims he never saw the memo. Okay, so go, going back to the problems. Okay, some of it is just not even reading your memos, and this is when your name is right on the memo. Because after 9-11, people would say, I didn't read or see the memo. Then the other excuse was, well, I read the memo, but I didn't share the information. George Tenet was briefed on the case in Minnesota in, in August, you know, two and a half weeks before 9-11, uh, when the directors uh, of, of CIA, the director of Central Intelligence, George Tenet, and Richard Clark were said to have their hair on fire. They were getting so much information in about uh, bin Laden determined to strike. And so, and actually the, the chapter title in the 9-11 Commission is the system was blinking red. They had lots of information. Later they called these dots and they said it was a failure to connect the dots because they had a lot of information. Well that's, um, and I'm just gonna, just to show you how much, how, how uh, people said, well no one would have known. We had an actual supervisor at the time who was on the phone and, and really quite desperate to make to see that headquarters would authorize some further investigation based on a, on twenty some pages of facts that they had developed about a suspicious uh, flight student in Minnesota who, by the way, ended up to be the only one 
uh, prosecuted for the 9-11 terrorist attacks, Musawi. And so he was desperate and he's on the phone and he says, don't you, and the guy's saying, no, we can't do anything. And he said, well, don't you know, this is a guy who could fly into the World Trade Center. He said this in August. And then after 9-11, Condi Rice said, no one would have known a plane would fly into a, a building. I mean, I sat there and went, oh my goodness, you know, it's like complete uh, cover up here. Besides the failure to share information inside agencies, between agencies, the 9-11 Commission said it also was a failure of the government to share information with the public. And this is very crucial because we've gotten into a situation now where we, we say we would just prefer not to know what they are doing to protect us. And if that means they classify and keep more things secret, I, I want that to happen because I want to stay safe. It is precisely the opposite. And that is actually the lesson of 9-11. The public is usually the ones who will learn some information and maybe it ties in with things that are, that are already in the public domain. The fellow passengers of the underwear bomber, the shoe bomber, the, the street vendors in New York City where a, a, a car that was loaded with a bomb came in and they noticed smoke, suspicious smoke coming in. You're going to find, and there's many more examples, you're going to find that it is actually the public that actually prevents terrorism. The, the great example of Edward Snowden, for instance, and afterwards they said, oh no, we've got to do all this collection of, 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 of information and trillions of pieces of data, whatever, because uh, that's how we prevent terrorism. Okay, that was the excuse that was initially said. They said, we've got 54 examples. And when they were pressed about it, what did they find? They found that uh, there was really no, no real true example of this massive uh, dragnet collection of innocent people, they found one flimsy example. And that's really with about a trillion dollars, uh, certainly hundreds of billions of dollars spent on this. So, I mean, if people knew that, I don't think we would be doing some of these things that are very counterproductive. These are just the, the pictures of the memos. They're too small to read, but we didn't know, for instance, that the memo said bin Laden determined to strike. Condi Rice had to put her head down when the commission asked her, and what's the name of that memo? And she kind of said, Bin Laden determined to strike in the United States. You know, and this, this was August 6th of 2001, where some of that flood of information was, was given to Bush. This is the, another memo, I'm not going to have time to go into it, but uh, where if they had read this memo with the names of FBI directors, assistant directors, it really would have changed everything. You know, you can't say it would have changed everything, but there are at least a half a dozen ways that if intelligence had been shared, that 9-11 quite likely or probably could have been prevented. And if it had been prevented, we never would have found ourselves in the situation of uh, being so traumatized that then we would allow this to be used as a pretext to launch war on Iraq. Um, these are some examples, and I know Ray is going to go into some more of these examples of fixing intelligence for, you know, policy. They, they have a prior agenda, and so wars are like this, unfortunately. You know, there's, there's been all these cases, the Gulf of Tonkin, and even the sinking of the Lusitania. There's been, throughout history, this desire to um, justi justify wars and even to sustain wars by coming up with these things. And the only thing I want to say here, you maybe can't read it too well, but uh, it, you know, it's not working and in fact it's even worse than it's not working. Uh, the war on terror has uh, increased, increased worldwide terrorism and, and there's different ways of looking at this, but counting and everything, but one count has it up 6,000%. So if all of these things were working to address it, and I, to be honest, I don't think they did fix the sharing intelligence very much. I think they actually went the opposite direction and increased secrecy. There's been an increase in secrecy even since 9-11. So uh, it's not, of course, drone. Drone bombing is a great example. Uh, we're talking about that because there's, there's an ad that's going to run in Des Moines. And drone bombing, uh, even our generals admit, does not win hearts and minds. 
Surprisingly enough, it does not win hearts and minds. And if, even if you are accurate, even if you are accurate, and you kill the high-level terrorists, according to the paper, General McChrystal says you create 10 more enemies. Well, you don't have to be a math genius to, say, to see that this is completely counterproductive. And it's, it can't possibly work. Um, there's, there's another kind of overarching uh, fudging of, uh, I guess, rationale more than intelligence. But we're all led to believe that, you, that this, this is a noble goal of bringing democracy, democracy and human rights to less fortunate countries that either have you know, leaders that either we don't like or, um, and actually in many cases, it's not just not liking them. I, I've told people that you know, these are not people that I would want, want to be my friends, like Saddam Hussein or uh, uh, the prior, the Taliban leader in Afghanistan or Gaddafi or uh, the, the Ukrainian leader or, uh, I mean, there's a whole list now of, of dicta what we call dictators and bad leaders. So the, the theory, Madeleine Albright was the one who came up with this initially. She, she said, we are the one exceptional, indispensable nation. And we have this responsibility now to um, you know, spread democracy. And by spreading democracy, somehow that will then gain stability and peace. So a lot of people think you know, the ends justify the means. And they think, well, if you have this great goal, then, uh, then maybe the, the use of uh, harsh economic sanctions. In the case of Mendel and Albright, they did put harsh economic sanctions on Iraq. And you know, part, you know, this is I think 98, 99, something like that. She's on a television show, and the, the reporter asked her, you know, about half a million children may have died because of these sanctions in Iraq. And Madeleine Albright says, we think it was worth it. OK, well, what is that? That's basically reflective of a utilitarian ethics. They call it utilitarian ethics, where the ends justify the means. We saw the same thing with torture. Torture was justified by, we'll find, we'll get the real reliable information, and that will save lives. Well, not only was it said many times, Dick Cheney is still saying this, and I think Carly Fiorina just said it the other day. But not only is it saying it, but we had television shows and movies, Zero Dark Thirty, how many people saw Zero Dark Thirty? A few. That show is complete fiction. They, they claim that it was made with CIA information from Leon Panetta, but in fact, it, I can talk to you afterwards and tell you this is factually completely incorrect on so many levels. And especially the idea that you are achieving a good goal by u utilizing a bad method. And this is this idea of bringing democracy. It's the same type of thing. We're killing now actually millions of people have died and uh, you know it's I can't believe more people don't understand this. Um, welcome to endless war. Um, they, the, our officials now have said it's going to be a long war. A uh, couple of elections ago McCain says this is going to be a war to last a hundred years. One time they said it'll be a three generation war. All different ways of saying perpetual war. There's no end to it. And I was involved in the war on drugs and the, uh, you know, even the war on crime, the war on poverty. When you set up something like this, it means that you can't end it. You know, we're never going to really probably beat all poverty or whatever. So same with terrorism or, or crime. Uh, by the way, some of these tactics, when they create more uh, violence, destabilization and violence, I'm pointing to the drones, <laughs> um, when they create, you have a perfect recipe for perpetual war. You know, that is, if, if this was selling a product and it was a business, it would be great because you're creating a market, you're creating what you are, but this is not what we want. We do not want to have perpetual war. So the, the answers are to reduce government secrecy and, and there's a lot of simple fixes. You know, they aren't what we've been doing, but they're actually very simple solutions if we can get the political will. So if we can get the people in, in positions to finally really start being truthful and answer some of these things, we can, uh, that's the answer. And, okay, moral high ground. Uh, moral high ground in the law is the fact that you don't have a policeman of the world. You have 
reciprocity between countries so that if one country violates that law, now the other countries are going to have the same, they're going to be allowed to violate it as well. This notion that the United States as exceptional can torture, for instance, and that anybody else who gets our people will torture them while well, they're violating international law. Well, the whole law will, will go into disarray if you have that. You can't have countries putting themselves, in our country, for instance, domestically, Nixon said if the president does it, it's not illegal. Okay, well, unfortunately, if you have wrongdoing on the top, then everybody down the line thinks, well, if they're committing wrongdoing, if they're cheating, I can do it too. And so we have a complete breakdown. And, and actually, it would be very useful uh, to have the moral high ground and benefit from international standards, things like due process that have stood the test of time. Um, you know, because that's what's promised to us. We'll prevent all terrorism as long as you give us all authority to do these things. And of course, you can't be. There's no way, you know, unless you get locked up in a jail cell that you can be safe, uh, safe and secure. Um, last, last thing I'm just going to bring up here <laughs> is, uh, and actually it's from the Catholic Worker. They came up with this bumper sticker of Jesus Loves WikiLeaks, which is from the Bible. Uh, and it is basically that secrecy is pernicious. You know, we, we, we kind of think, oh, it's got to be secret. The government can't let us know. It can't give out information. Um, secrecy will degrade and degenerate all of our institutions if we allow it to. I worked in, in the FBI, and I will tell you that criminal conspiracies require secrecy. And so what we want to, to keep people doing their best, keep them on, the, on a higher level, is we want transparency. And this is where, um, I'm going to stop here, but this is where if we can get more honesty, more transparency from elected leaders, from candidates, and actually even from our, our, our media, even from our reporters right now, because many times you'll find the, re the media is complicit with this. They're not printing the truth. They're helping fix the in intelligence. And uh, if we can answer these questions on here and get, get leaders to go through them, you know what? I think we actually now do begin to wade back out of this neck deep in the big muddy. I think this is the answer, is to actually, but there's, we need more of us, and we need more people participating, we need more people caring uh, about the problem.